You ready to do this, Matt? I'm ready to do this, Spence. Punch it, Chewy. Welcome, super friends, to the Fortress of Nerditude podcast, a safe place to talk about all things in nerd and pop culture. I'm Spencer Stapleton, and my co-pilot tonight is Matt Shaw. We're two nerds that just refuse to grow up. Thank you for joining us. This is episode 136. We release every Thursday morning. You can find the website, fortofnerd.com. There's links to iTunes, Google Music, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, and everywhere podcasts are available. Stop by and relax a while. If you like what you're hearing, hit that subscribe button and get us automatically each and every week in your ear holes. Matt, welcome back to the podcast. How are you today? Oh, I am doing well. I'm glad to be back. Thanks for having me back. I must not have uh, screwed things up too poorly last time. So, I mean, you know, the podcast <laughs> is still around. So, <laughs> That's good to hear. No, I'm doing good, though. Doing well. It's, uh, it's a holiday week, and... You know, 4th yeah, of by July the way, happy 4th of July. Yeah, sure. I, I, I say happy 4th of July now because we're recording Monday, but when the podcast releases, it'll actually be the 4th. So happy, happy Independence fourth. Day. Yes, happy yeah. 4th to you as well and to everyone listening. May the fireworks rain on you. Now, real quick, for our one listener in Thailand and our one listener in Spain that listen consistently every week, week in and week out, I hope you're having a great Thursday. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I doubt it's a, a holiday there nationally for you in Thailand or in Spain, but uh, I hope you're having a good Thursday and you can celebrate in spirit with those of us over here in the States that are, uh, you know, taking the day off of work. Hmm. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. That's way cool. International. Totally international. I'm into that. So, so anyway, Matt, what have you been up to since the last time we spoke a couple weeks back? Goodness, goodness. Well, we... Just bought a house last month, so it's been a lot of work, but mm. fun work. I mean, uh, you know, this is our first time to play house, so to speak, so we've done a lot of painting and decorating and new appliances, and so there's some good stuff, some bad stuff, some frustrating things, but overall, it's been awesome. Yeah. Home so, ownership. I like that you're like, good things, bad things, some frustrating things. I'm like, you're going to get more of that frustrating things uh, yeah, it's, than you than you imagine. It's more than so you think. You, how long have you been in the house now? So we moved in May 10th. Okay. So, so yeah, you've been like six weeks in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're so grateful. <laughs> uh, Apartment yeah. life is hard with a two-year-old who wants to run around and play all day and neighbors who don't want to hear her run around and play all day. Yeah, yeah. Before, were you like on the bottom floor, top floor? No, we were floor? top floor with Ooh. wood floors. And so every little, they were banging on our ceilings constantly. They refused to really? understand that we have a two-year-old. It was like three o'clock in the afternoon and they're banging on the ceiling. And I was just like, man... We got to get out of here. I don't care what I did, have to do. Did they? Did the neighbors like work like a night shift or something? So they're trying nope. to sleep at three in the afternoon? Nope. 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 They just hated us. Wow. It is what it wow. is. But uh, they're happy because we're gone and we're happy because we're gone. So yeah, it's been good though. We're, um, we're gearing up to have lots of family over for the 4th of July, so we've had to make sure most of the things are in order and ready to go. So it's been it's been a lot of work like I said, but it's been it's been a lot of fun. Uh tomorrow is my wife's birthday, so yeah, by the way, tell her I said happy birthday <laughs> tonight or tomorrow fine, and then when she listens to you on the podcast, happy birthday, Jesse. Love it. Two, two days late. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting it before and I'm getting it after. I'm covering my bases. I here. love it. That's awesome. Yeah. So we're going to go um, go to the Cheesecake Factory for dinner. And we got this cool outdoor mall here in San Antonio, La Cantera, which is really nice. It's got some cool shops. We're going to hang out and uh, party all night. How far are you from Austin? About an hour. Okay. You need to do me a favor because I don't know when I'm going to get to Austin anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Try to find some time to go to Austin. You're going to have to get up real early in the morning and go to Franklin Barbecue and get some brisket. I don't know if I have the patience to wait that long. 
I know. Is it man. that much better? Because I mean, I get good brisket here. A place called Smoke Shack. I love it. It is nice, beautiful, smoky brisket. I don't know. I've I I know about Franklin's. Like my I bought my dad a barbecue book, the Franklin barbecue book. Actually, was it the um, what's it called the the smoke? Oh, what's the name of that book? It's like the Smoke Meisters, like manifesto or something I think like that. So. No, I don't know. Maybe, probably, sure. It's the one about Aaron Franklin, kind of like how he, yeah, he kind of grew into the phenomenon that you know his place has right, become, right, and right, right, how right. he started in his like little trailer he parked on the side of the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. So I, I will try because oh, I do man. love good barbecue, but I don't know if I can wake up and wait in that line. <laughs> so I watched a movie called Chef uh, about a week ago. Uh-huh. And it's with John Favreau. It was in 2014. And the whole kind of plot of the story is like he was this high-end chef who loses his job. He ends up buying a kind of like a taco truck, essentially. But he has to fly to Miami to pick it up. He cleans it up, and then he decides to sell Cubanos, uh, Cuba, you know, Cuban sandwiches, Cubanos, out of it and drives it from Miami to L.A., while selling food all along the way in each city, he does something a little bit different with the Cubano to make it like unique to that city. And they show a scene in there where they stop in Austin at Franklin's <laughs> and they meet with Aaron Franklin and he gives them like four briskets that they can slice up and use oh, cool. to make these Cubanos. And I saw that and I've been watching a bunch of Aaron Franklin stuff on YouTube and reading stuff of his. I, th- to me, like right now that feels like the Mecca of brisket. Yeah. Especially like Central Texas brisket, like, mm-hmm. and I know he's won like every barbecue award out there, and so uh, knowing that you're like an hour away, man, just one time, Matt, <laughs> one time, Matt, you just got to do it for me, man. Ooh, one time, we're gonna talk about that later, but anyway, we're okay. I got nice, yeah. Anyway, uh, but yeah, so that's what's been going on here. It's been uh, hectic and crazy, but like I said, lots of fun. I mean, we got a little. Little boy on the way coming in October, so my wife's starting have to you, feel it now. Yeah. Have you guys decided on a name yet? Okay. You're going to like this. Oh, so here we go. Jesse wouldn't let me name him what we're going to call him. I'm just going to say that first, okay? Okay. You will know him as, and everybody else will know him as Lando. His gotcha. His name will be Landon, because Jesse wouldn't let me mm. name him Lando. Is the is it so are you gonna spell L A N D O N? Correct. So then you can just drop off yep, the N and just call him exactly Lando. Exactly it. I like it. I like that. Lando. So Is she gonna have a problem when we just call him Lando all no, the time? No, no, she likes the name. She just is like formally that's kind of weird. And I was like, okay, I get that. No, I'm fine with that. I get that. Well it's it's kinda like Charlie. So Charlie, I wanted to name a little boy Charlie mm-hmm. uh, after my grandfather, and then his, you know, so his full name is Charles Gary Stapleton. So it's Charles is my grandfather's name who would passed; he never met. Gary's my father's name who would passed; he'd never met. And so I always wanted a little boy named Charlie, but Charles is his full name, and it's you know uh, an homage to my grandfather and then my father. And that's a good formal name. It's a good business yes, name. Yes, totally. But t- to family and friends, he's just Charlie. Yep. And he can go by Charlie his whole life. But if he ever chooses to use the more formal version, he can go by Charles right. if he chooses. Yep. I'll never call him Charles. <laughs> no, but, I won't either. I can't imagine doing that now. Yeah. So I like that. I- I'm with Jesse. I think that's smart. Call it him is Landon. smart. I'm into yeah, it yeah, too. Yeah. We we made a good compromise. Please tell me, please tell me, please tell I me you're going to name him Cal Rizian as a middle name. I asked her if I could even Cal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. No? No. It, that's two on the nose. So mm. we went with the family thing. My dad's name, Brian, okay. is now going to be his middle name. So it'll be Landon Brian Shaw. Landon, Lando Brian Shaw. That's right, Lando. Lando B. Shaw. That's not bad. Uh, that's not bad at all. I mean... Lando B. Calrissian Shaw. Try to sl- see. Here's the thing. I get to if write you it. can fill if you can fill out the paperwork <laughs> while she's still like you know hopped up on drugs. Oh, yeah. Ooh, I, I'm sorry, honey. My hand just slipped and I broke, I broke Calrissian, Calrissian by accident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's believable. She'll buy it. She'll buy it. She's not stubborn at all, so it it will be uh, no problem. Wow, that would be awesome. So okay, cool. but yeah, Lando, I like that. Yeah, we're excited. We're real excited. I, I always said that if uh, Breed and I ever had twins 
And one was a boy, one was a girl, Luke and Leia. Yeah, it's you have easy. To. Yeah, you got to. Yeah, I hear you. you. Have to. Yep. And then if it's if it's boys, Han and Chewie. Oh. She she didn't think Chewie that was the short as end funny. of the stick there. <laughs> Chewie. What's it short for? Chewbacca. Chewbacca. Oh, wow. That's that's interesting. Han Solo <laughs> Chewbacca Solo Stapleton. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I yeah. I tried to work solo in too, but it doesn't work. Solo yeah. Shaw. None of that seems to work well. Oh, well. Lando's good, though. Yeah, we'll like take that. it. We'll cool. take it. One of my favorite nice. smooth talkers. Love him. Mm. You need to get him, like, his first little outfit. Because you know how, like, everyone has, like, that first little outfit that you bring the baby home from the, the hospital in. And, like, yeah. you know, it matters. And in reality, it really doesn't. Of course not. It's just something, you know. Uh, some wives get really, you know, excited about that. I, I kind of looked at him, like, just put him in a diaper and a onesie and let's get him home. Yeah. Um. But you should get him like a little blue satin cape. I'm into it. A cape. Uh huh. A cape. Get him a get him a little Lando cape. He's so yep. cool. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. His name is Lando. That's stupid. You know, get him little get him little felt sideburns to oh, tape on the side gosh. of his head. Oh my gosh! Mustache. Halloween will come right after he's born. That's it. Uh-huh. That's easy. Oh, that is the easiest costume every year for the rest of his life. He's gonna be Lando Calrissian. Oh, so I like good. It. Anyway, I love what's it. going on with you? How was your week? Uh, my man, my week's been good. It's been busy. Let me ask you a question. Is, Mm. is your daughter doing this whole like Toy Story 4 toy madness from McDonald's with the Happy Meals? Are you guys doing that at all? So, uh, no. And the reason is she won't eat that crap. Really? We eat it. We had Sonic today, actually. She took her first bites at Cheeseburger and she was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. So now Jesse's excited about going and getting those McDonald's toys for her, but uh, she does not yet. Her eyes have not yet been opened to that experience. Mm, you send her to Uncle Uncle Spencer, and I, oh, I can I, help with that. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I am the baby whisperer when it comes to getting kids to eat food. That's true. You got her to eat bacon. Always remember that. And she, now she likes I'd... it anyway. Proceed, nice kids, man. It's like my boys the other day. Like they were like, I don't like brisket. I'm like, you love brisket. And I tell them that they love it, and then they try a little bit of it, and then they loved it. <laughs> And so, like, the other night I made them, like, grilled cheese sandwiches, and I slid some brisket in there, too. Oh, yeah. And they were like, they're like, uh, and I was like, smell it. And then they went, ooh, what is that? I'm like, it's brisket, and you love it. They ate the entire dang sandwich, oh, each of them. That's a good dad. Mm-mm. I mean, you just, you got to trick kids. I mean, I know you should be honest that's in all your true. dealings with your children, but no, no. You trick no, those you, little rug yeah. rats into eating whatever you make them. Yeah. yeah. Firm, firm believer. Anyway, the reason I ask is that my kids... They they started off only eating chicken nugget Happy Meals, and then I forced them to start eating like a hamburger or a cheeseburger. I made them like alternate. I was like, nope, they don't have chicken nuggets today. You got to get a hamburger mm-hmm. or cheeseburger. You choose. And now most of the time, Jackson will choose a cheeseburger, and Charlie still kind of flips between hamburger or chicken nuggets. But they ask every dang day oh, no. to go there because <laughs> right now they're doing Toy Story 4 toys, and there's 10 of them. And when you get these 10 little they look like little carnival games. They all fit together to make the RV oh, that is prominently so featured in the movie. It is oh, so smart. Gosh. But as a father, let me tell you, oh, I can't no. tell you how many times they're like, Daddy, we already have this toy. Can you please go exchange it? Can you go out tonight <laughs> to exchange it? I have driven like this like these last two weeks to every Walmart within a few, like maybe five mile, ten mile mm. radius exchanging toys so that we don't have repeats so they can complete it. We are two toys away and tonight they went and they got a repeat. And so they said, please, can you exchange it after your podcast? And can you bring us the new toy and put it on our pillow next to us so we can wake up to it in the morning? I'm like, gosh, I am not Santa Claus. I am your father. (laughs) Yeah. Santa Claus Uh, meets the tooth fairy. (laughs) Seriously. So anyway, I've been doing a lot of that, which is, I get it. Like, I could probably just say no, and I could be kind of that dad, just like, nope, you get what you get, you uh-huh. don't throw a fit, just deal with it. Yep. But I'm trying to like help them acquire this because it means a lot to them right now. Yeah. yeah. So I, I should say that I'm being a good father, but I'm doing it resentfully. So <laughs> yeah, I can't really pat myself on the back. But you're doing um, it, you know. I know. You're I know. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, so this weekend we went to go see a movie with some friends, and our garage door broke on us oh, no. right as we were leaving. Oh, Always no. a good time. Always a good time. Um, but here's the thing. So I called a garage door place, uh, A-plus garage doors, 
called them this morning and they said, Hey, we can get someone to your place at four o'clock this afternoon. So I was like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll make it home. I get home and uh, a gentleman named Tony shows up at the door. He comes in and he walks through the house, gets in the garage. He starts looking at it, this, that, and the other. He says, okay, let me go get some tools and I'll, I'll give you a full evaluation. And he does. And he gives me a price quote. And obviously it's more than I want to spend because I wasn't wanting Don't to spend anything. Of course, yeah. Yeah. But he knew exactly what was wrong and he was meticulous and he had like all these things. He's like, well, because this, this, and this was done incorrectly, it caused strain on this and that bolt grinded down your drum and then this happened and that's why it popped off and it broke. And, th- you know, so he was like, he had like seven things he was going to do, oh, but wow. it was only going to replace like four things. Uh-huh. And so he did all that. But as he was walking through the house, one of the times he saw my computer set up with my microphone, he says, hey, it looks like you got a little podcast set up there. <laughs> and I said, actually, I do. And... Uh, He asked me about the podcast and I told him a little bit about it. He's like, oh, that's cool. I listen to a lot of podcasts, you know, during work. It's something I can do. And so he looked it up and he subscribed to the podcast. Wow. So I just, I just want to say, Tony, our new listener, uh, you did a great, fantastic job. I went on Google and I reviewed you to let your bosses know you did a great job. And thanks for uh, joining us here on the Fortress Nerditude and becoming a new super friend. Love it. Tony, you're the man. He is the man. Uh, let's see what else. I've been playing a lot of Apex Legends still. Mm. Uh, season two drops tomorrow. And by the time the podcast comes out, it'll be two days ago. But I'm excited for that. They're going to change up the map some, introduce a new character. They're going to do some things. They're going to, you know, shake up the landscape, so to speak. I'm actually getting a little bit better at the game. I'm not just well, utter good. trash now. <laughs> I'm just like sort of trash now. Yeah, okay. Which is fun. Which is fun. I'm 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 getting some more kills. I've won a few games. You know, I'm I'm getting my feet wet. I'm I'm starting to feel it out. It's nice. It's nice. Uh, I'm spending a lot of time, Matt, still trying to fix our backyard. I told you how how I tore up the backyard, right, and how I planted all the grass. Mm. Um, and then I I planted more seed and more. Like I seeded that backyard like probably five times this spring, and now that we're kind of in the throes of summer. Uh, all that new grass is starting to die. It's all like yellowed and yeah. it's all like thin grass. It hasn't like really fully gotten big and lush yet. Mm. So I'm current. I currently got one of those like little oscillating sprinklers I can leave going like all day if I need to. And I'm going to try to get this thing like as wet and watered as I can because, you know, we're into the, like the low nineties now during the daytime here. Yeah. And that's, that's just hot enough that with no shade in our backyard, our grass is going to burn, and I just yeah, do not tough. want all that hard work to go to waste. Yeah, yeah, that's hard. I'm ready. If this doesn't work, I, I tell you what, super friends, I'm going to rent a backhoe. I'm going to <laughs> scoop out the top three feet of dirt, or actually clay, because it's mostly clay, in our backyard, and I'm going to bring in new topsoil, and I'm going to sod that thing. I don't care if it costs me, like, a house payment for, like, you know, a year a year's worth of house payments. I've got to get a good backyard. I just, I want something good that the kids can run around in. Back there right now, it's like potholes and like yeah. hard compacted clay and just, ugh. Blah. So, that's me, well, man. Best of that, luck on that. It's that whole, Matt, it's that whole like, you know, hey, some of the homeowning stuff can <sighs> be kind of depressing. That. That's backyard right. stuff is mine. Do you yeah. guys have much yard? Um, We have, uh, it's pretty small. Um, relatively well maintained though emmy loves to go out there we bought a little swing that we hung from a tree and so she wants to swing all the time yeah um, which is cute it is at that for age like 10 just, minutes right she wants but to it's swing the for an hour <laughs> yeah and when that's i when say you like it's uh, jesse it's not me let's be honest yeah. it's jesse that's when you hook there. up a rope you hook up a rope that goes all the way to the inside of the house and you just kind of <laughs> pull it and like don't pay attention and you know yeah just pull her and look at me look at me yeah 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 you're fine you're, you're fine great. so proud of you you're the best yeah. goodness yeah anyway uh I, I told you i've got our in-laws your in-laws and my in-laws coming into town oh and so we're doing the whole uh fourth of july thing this upcoming week so i'll talk about that i guess a little bit next week in my kind of week review and wrap up but uh, you know, getting some shopping done, getting ready to make some barbecue. We're gonna do some ribs, and Very and then I nice. think I'm gonna do another brisket on Sunday eve on Sunday. So. Atta boy, yeah, Atta boy. 
It's an just, art, man. Mm. It's an art. Take some time to get it down perfectly. That's for sure. It is, man. There, there's part of me wants to like find a way to like do this as like a side business. Sure. I don't know how. I mean, sure. I don't. But it's just like, man, when you make something that good, it's like I just want to share it with people, and I want to share it with people, but I want to make money <laughs> on it so I can like pay to do this. You're like, you know, I don't want to yeah. do it for free. Yeah, man. Yeah, love it. I don't, don't know how yet, but. You got to get to Austin, man. You got to let me know how it I is. I do. I got to. I got to. Been to Austin many times. Just never stopped in for the barbecue. Yeah, well, put that on your bucket list. Yes, sir. That or maybe maybe I'll have to make a special trip down there and we'll have like a, maybe we'll call it like a, a brother-in-law weekend or something. There you go. And use an excuse to like get away from our wives and kids and uh, just hit like a bunch of, you know, barbecue joints and, you I know, whatever. never say no to that. Hmm, we'll have to talk. Hmm. Well, what do you say, Matt? Should we uh, get this train a rolling and uh, kill some Bothans? Let's do it. I always have to let you know, many Bothans died to bring us this information. Rest in peace, you Bothans. All right, Matt, we are into Rebel Intelligence. What do you have for me this week? We've got some news, some more news from another live action Disney film. Oh, when will these things end? They will never end until Uh, there's no more animated films and they have to remake live action. Right. Then it will just be weird. Eventually they're going to be like, they're like, we're doing a live action (laughs) remake of the Lion King two and a half. You're like the direct to video one. Yeah, man. With that one lion with like the Mohawk. Anyway. Long story yeah. short, uh, Al- or not Aladdin, uh, Little Mermaid. Oh. One of my wife's most favorite movies has potentially found its Ursula. Not yet confirmed completely. However, the reports okay. are saying that Melissa McCarthy will be playing Ursula. Really? So my initial thought is... At- I don't like Melissa McCarthy to be just kind of straightforward with it. Just, just her just as an actor or just her as a comedian? As a comedian, I just, I'm just, just not a fan. Hit, just to hit your phony bone. No, it just doesn't do it for me. Okay. I don't know. Something about it. Just not my, not my favorite. However, I think she could do a good Ursula because I, I don't like yeah. Ursula either. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it works well for me. Well, the interesting thing about this is that I'm assuming that Ursula, since it's going to be, you know, an octopus is, you know, lower half and then it's usually kind of the female upper half. I'm assuming it's going to be CGI. Right. I want to, but it's mostly going to be on her. Maybe, but I would assume though, she definitely will be doing the voice acting, right? Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, that's, I mean, that's not bad. I'm trying to, I'm just thinking of her voice and I think she could. She could do a convincing Ursula. Mm. I think she could do it too. Not a mm. fan of her, but that's okay. I'm so okay. So here's the thing. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of so and so on the whole like live action things. Like I get it. You get to remake movies that you already own the intellectual property to, so you don't have to pay for scripts to really be mm-hmm. written. You don't have yep. to. I mean, you do have to do a screenplay version of it that'll adapt over to live action. I, I get that. But they're making these things for a fraction of the cost if they were doing some new IP and had to get new story and, you know, whatnot. I get I get all that. Mm-hmm. Some of the things like Lion King and like Jungle Book and whatnot, like I get those. Let me ask you, you've got a daughter. I, I don't. But the idea of The Little Mermaid, there's some interesting themes with the little mermaid if if we're like especially if we're looking at it through the lens of 2019 and yeah you know kind of post the me too movement and whatnot i mean mm-hmm. this is like a 16 year old girl yeah it's weird well man. a 16 year old female mermaid I, I don't want to say girl but like you know who who wants a better life and wants to be changed into a human doesn't want to be the person she is so she can be the a better version of herself mm-hmm. to attract a man mm-hmm. and Typically, you know, she's just a girl swimming around in two seashells yeah. and a fin. Yeah. Yeah. And I just wonder how they're going to do that uh, in a live action that's not going to be weird or creepy. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I oh, yeah, definitely know what you're saying. <laughs> I get it. I, I'm not sure either. I, I would assume they're going to change some of the story beats. Some of the... I, I would assume that. Um, I would hope so. I, I almost feel like they'd have to, but the costuming is an interesting predicament. I don't know. It would be weird. Like me as like a grown man with a wife and child going to see a 16-year-old swimming around in a fin and seashells. It's a little bit weird, a little bit creepy. Um, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. We don't know much yeah. about this movie, honestly. They haven't told us anything. This is really the first, I feel like this is the first thing I've heard about it other than that it is happening. We don't know who... Ariel is going to be, we don't know, like he's, to your point, we don't know if it's going to be in the vein of a CG, like Jungle Book and right. uh, yeah, Lion yeah. King thing, or if it's going to be like Aladdin where they're there. And is the genie going to be more like the genie, you know, or is Melissa McCarthy going to be like the genie in that it has the face of Will Smith or Melissa McCarthy? It, you know, we don't know anything about it. We got no yeah. idea. We got no idea. Hmm. But that's what's going I... on. Yeah, I'm. I don't know. Eh, I'm so. I, I'm kind of torn on this. I, I I get it, and I think it'll make money. Yep. And I know Little Mermaid's huge. I mean, it was big in 1989 when it came out, mm-hmm. and it's you know beloved by women and young women everywhere the world over. I just. I know Aladdin. A lot of people struggled with Aladdin because we start getting to the place where you remake something like Jungle Book. And you go, okay, that's the 1960s, you know, Disney movie, Mm -hmm. uh, an animated Disney movie. Fine. You can do things. You can take some liberties. But, like, you start getting into, like, Lion King and Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, kind of that, really that, you know, resurgence that Disney had in the late 80s, early 90s, where they just started hitting, you know, home run after home run after home run. Yeah. And people have some really strong nostalgia and if you don't do it right, it could, you know, it could not be as well as Disney would like. And I, I think Aladdin suffered with some of that. I didn't see it. I, not for any reason uh, other than it just the, to your point, the uh, Aladdin and the Lion King were my two favorite movies growing up because they were movies about the boys and I didn't right. get a lot of yes. those when I was a kid from, oh, the poor, you know, middle-aged white man talking about this, but I didn't get a lot of stories <laughs> up, up from Disney, right? Animated films for me, you know, that like, it was cool to like watch an animated movie because Aladdin was just this freaking parkour, awesome, right? you know, guy who wanted this girl that was way out of his league, the story that we all have. And uh, Lion King was, that movie still just, I don't know. That one just hits yeah. me still to this day. It just makes me want I, to cry. I do know what you're saying. For a long time, it was all about the Disney princesses. Oh, yeah. And the boys that were in those just kind of, you know, showed up at the end and gave a kiss or gave a rose yeah. or, you know, saved the day. And then it's like, oh, everything is Cinderella. Like, you know, yeah. he just kind of strides in at the end and everything, uh-huh. da, da, da. And then they're off into the sunset. Yeah. But the whole movie's about Cinderella. Same thing with Sleeping Beauty. The whole thing's about Sleeping Beauty mm-hmm. or Snow White. I mean, it's all, mm-hmm. I get that. And then, you know, yeah, you, you get in in the early 90s, man, like, yeah, Lion King and Aladdin. And then eventually you kind of get like the toy stories. And it's like, then you started getting some some more balance. But uh, yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see. Aladdin didn't, uh, the trailers didn't do anything for me, just to be honest. I heard that that it was more, should have been called Jasmine. Instead of Aladdin, it was more about her and her story, which is uh. fine. Um, I, I, I'm cool with that, but I don't know. It didn't get make me excited. However, The Lion King is making me excited. I'll yeah. watch anything that's got my boy Childish Gambino in yep. it. I am yes. so excited. And they got the music. I mean, it's just, it's it's hitting all the right notes for me. It doesn't look like they changed a bunch of stuff. I hear Mufasa's voice and I know what's going on. Anyway, we started talking mm. about The Little Mermaid and what's, you know, quickly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so speaking of something I'm really excited about, there, there's a new movie coming down the pipe, Bill and Ted 3, and I, I'm i over the moon for this thing. <laughs> the original one, I think, came out in 1989. 
I remember I was about 10 years old when it came out. I saw it in the theater. I've seen it many, many, many times. The second one was kind of so-so. Um, but we're getting more casting news uh, coming out of the third one. So, of course, we know you know Bill and Ted, the original a- actors, Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves, are are coming back. Uh, it was announced that uh, Amy Stotch and Hal Landon Jr. are going to come back and reprise their roles as, you know, Bill's mom slash Missy and then Ted's, you know, strict father. Uh, they're going to be reprising their roles. Beck Bennett, who's on Saturday Night Live, is also going to join the cast as Ted's younger brother, Deacon, which I think is kind of cool because, you know, Deacon had a very, very small role in the first film. And the fact that they're going to bring in someone and maybe expand that role a little bit. Um, they've also recast the wives, the princesses, if you've ever seen the first movie. <laughs> yeah. And which is funny because they had the original, uh, the original girls in the first movie. Then they were recast for the second movie. Now they're being recast again for the third movie. And I love this because it makes me think of like the National Lampoon vacation movies where they recast the roles of the kids in every Everyone. single movie. And uh, I don't know if that's intentional or just, you know, the original actresses, you know, didn't didn't do it or whatever, but uh, they've been recast. And then there's also some uh, some new people that have been, you know, cast as the daughters of Bill and Ted. Uh, They're going to be in the in the show as well. Bridget Lundy Payne and Samara Weaving. So it seems to me that this is still going to focus on the Wild Stallions. It's still going to be about you know their musical destiny and the journey they're on, and we know that they're still going to go do some time travel hijinks and meet historical figures. But it, to me, it also sounds like they're expanding the family role and the family dynamic of of the you know of the Bill and Ted franchise, which I think is a good thing, Matt, because you got Bill you know Bill and Ted who are now going to be probably like in their fifties, yeah. And if you're just following these two aging rock stars in the fifties and you're not seeing anything about their family life, that's not going to feel, that's not going to feel right. I mean, it's one of those things where like you start hearing, I know this is a weird comparison, but like Neil Diamond, like in his early career, he'd go on tour and it was, you know, Neil Diamond and his band and whatever. But like, as they started growing more and people are getting married and starting to have kids, eventually like Neil Diamond started like traveling with like their entire families and this and that. And you hear all these stories about rock stars and, you know, musical artists that as they get older, they don't want to be on the road and be away from their families. So they start having their families come with them and travel more and be a part of that. And so I think we're going to see more of that kind of aging rock star and being surrounded by their family. And I think that's, I think that could be really good. So News in the Bill and Ted world. Are you a big Bill and Ted fan? Have you seen the movies? I've seen the movies. Um, never really got into it, though. Hmm. I think it's one of those things where I think you had to be of, like, that right age when the first movie came out. Yeah. Because it is really funny. Like, it is really funny. It has some great some great elements to it. And it's just kind of that silly, like, you know. It is very kind of, silly kind of just you know brain dead california teenager yeah high school you know yeah, yeah, burnout yeah. kind of feel to it but like yeah i remember you just it, w- it was a time like if you were to make that movie now for the first time brand new that may not go over so as well as it did back then right yep I agree, so, but uh, I think it'll do well. I mean, I know that it's got a huge cult following, so there's a reason yeah. they're making a third one, um, and I'm sure I'll see it. I've, I'm going to go see it the opening weekend. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I lo- believe it. I love those movies. Yeah. Anyway. Totally. All right, so I've got some news from the world, again, of Disney. Ooh. But this is Disney Plus, the oh, upcoming streaming service that I will be deeply into all right anyway. november 11th <laughs> so excited um the falcon and winter soldier tv series is going to begin filming in october Ooh, we don't know a title uh spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen infinity war so mute now or not infinity war infinity war 2 whatever the heck that one was called end game end game yes mute mute now but uh yeah, it's called the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but we know that the Falcon will probably 
be reprising his role as a Falcon or probably not as Captain yeah. America. Uh, it yeah. looks like from you know what we know, he was asked a couple of questions about it. And he says, uh, I'm guessing I'm foul cap, foul dash cap. Uh, mm. I don't know. I haven't even seen a script yet. So reportedly beginning filming in October, but Anthony Mackie, who plays Falcon, has not yet seen a script. Doesn't know who he is going to be playing. Wink, that wink. That to me says... Nod, nod. There, yeah, I mean, there's that. But to me, that also says that we're not going to be getting this series day one when Disney Plus oh, opens up. Oh, definitely not. No, this is like... I don't know. Six s- months a year down the road? Spring after to that? summer of next year? Yeah, yeah. Which makes sense, because you're not going to want to front load all new series no. right at the very beginning. No. No, you've got Star Wars starting it off. Yeah, Mandalorian. Mandalorian yes. comes out that that day, it'll be massive, and then all the Disney movies to get us through, and more series. But yeah, it sounds like this one's still a ways off. Um, but they're starting it up. So, and you would assume, uh, I don't know the individual who plays the Winter Soldier, but uh, I, I would assume that they're all going to reprise their roles, just like Loki and Tom Hiddleston. They're all reprising their roles for these. Uh, adaptations from disney plus but this is exciting i mean it's it's cool to know that we're getting more story from these characters outside of what we're seeing in the movies yeah and yeah they're going to be important to see them all to understand the total mcu which is cool i'm i'm very hopeful for this series because i was i been very impressed by what they did on netflix with the marvel series even though those have all kind of been canceled because they were being financed by mm-hmm. Netflix and Netflix knows that they're leaving for Disney plus. Um, but I, I was really impressed by that. I've been really impressed with the movies. I don't doubt that these shows in the Marvel universe that are going to be on Disney plus are going to be like top notch quality television. Yep. So I'm looking forward to that, but I think you're right. Spring, summer of 2020. Yep. Somewhere around there. But progress is being made. It's exciting. I like that. I like that. Uh, Speaking of progress being made, this is interesting. I didn't know that uh, we're getting a kind of Sherlock Holmes story, although it's not quite Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to be the story of Enola Holmes, which is the younger sister to Sherlock and Mycroft. So... Apparently, in 2006, there was uh, some books called the Enola Holmes Mysteries uh, by an author named Nancy Springer, and she tells the story of Mycroft and Sherlock's younger sister, who's a highly capable detective in her own right, and the interesting thing about this is that there's going to be um, a show, I think the show or a movie that they're going to do based off of one of these books. And Hollywood Reporter is reporting that Henry Cavill, who we know most recently as Superman from Man of Steel and, you know, Justice League and Batman v Superman, has actually joined on to play Sherlock Holmes. And he's joining the Millie Bobby Brown of Stranger Things, who's going to be playing Enola Holmes. Oh, really? Yes. And so... We're going to get this, you know, this project, you know, this, this thing in this Sherlock Holmes world, but I don't know, I don't know that it's necessarily going to be Sherlock Holmes. It's going to be a Nola Holmes. So it's going to focus on Millie Bobby Brown. So my question is how much Henry Cavill are we actually going to get? I would guess not much. I, I mean, I can't think a lot because maybe like wouldn't a Sherlock role of some sort. Yeah, because wouldn't Sherlock just overshadow it, every absolutely. other Holmes? Absolutely. The second he walks in, the, your attention and focus changes, and yeah. yeah. Another real quick thing in the uh, Henry Cavill world, and this isn't like an official, like I don't have this as a Rebel Intelligence article, but. Uh, the Netflix series The Witcher, based on the books, ah. which you know be- also became the video game, they released a bunch of still images today of Henry Cavill as Geralt Rivera, and it looks pretty good. 
I did I, I see mean, those images as well. It looks legit. They yeah, did a good it, it job. Does, it does look really, really good. So we got a lot more Henry Cavill coming down the road, even if it's not as Superman. Yes. Which makes me a little sad because I thought he was a great Superman. He was a great Superman. Um, I didn't love the movies, though. I think he did a good job, but the movies were not. I, DC I has agree. Not been, yeah, I don't know. I agree. And, and, and the reason is this. Go back to the Christopher Reeve suit. Go back to Superman and yeah. then Superman 2. Superman 3 and 4, eh, the writing was, you know, it was kind of a cash grab at that point. But you go back to Superman and Superman 2, and the way those were done, you just, you understand that, like, Superman is truth, justice, the American way. You know, he's bright, he's right. hopeful, you know, all these things that we know Superman to be. And then when they did, you know, Man of Steel in 2013, it was off the heels of all of, you know, Christopher Nolan's Batman stuff, and they wanted to keep it kind of the darker dark, and moody. Bat- or, uh, Superman. Uh, yeah. Superman. Yeah. And yeah. that just that just isn't Doesn't the character. Work. And uh, so I felt like they were okay movies, but boy, I, I man, I would have wished for a lot more. And not that Henry Cavill didn't do his best, but... You can't, you know, actors can't change the tone and the way it's filmed and yep. the look and the writing. So, yep, I agree. Anyway, that's true. That's that's what I got for Henry Cavill news for the day. <laughs> well, I've got some news regarding one of my favorite men, and this is my man Paul Rudd. Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Rudd is going to be in the next Ghostbusters movie. Yeah. And I I saw this a couple of days ago, and I was so excited. I was already stoked for this movie, right? I returned. The female Ghostbusters was fine. I I, I I didn't see it. At best, it was fine. Some okay stuff. But the true sequel to Ghostbusters 1 and 2, I mean, all-time favorite movies. People hate on Ghostbusters 2. I don't know why. I'm a fan of Ghostbusters 2. I love it. That movie, it was so creepy. It was the creep factor that I loved. That dude in the pain, oh, all that stuff was Vigo. so creepy, dude. Vigo oh the my Carpathian. Gosh. And yeah. I, oh my, anyway, well, I could go talk about these movies forever. But Paul Rudd is going to be in Ghostbusters 3, um, but not as a Ghostbuster. Ooh. He's a teacher. Okay. He's a teacher, which I, I, I'm going to assume that he's a teacher of these kids that are going to be ghostbusters because we know uh finn from stranger things fame yep is going to be one of these teenagers who will be taking up i would assume taking up the mantle of ghostbuster teen ghostbuster Mm. i don't know um i would assume he's going to be their teacher and i forget who the other oh they they cast somebody else anyway as the as his female counterpart as Ghostbusters, but anyway, this is this is exciting. My mind when I heard this, I went and all the possibilities. Right? Yeah. Was he? Is he? Um, I don't know. I I don't know who he is. It just is exciting to me. Is he someone's kid? Is he some? I mean, he seems to be privy probably to the Ghostbusting world. Has some knowledge there, or. Or it could be like Rick Moranis in the in the first movie, right? He wasn't a Ghostbuster, but he was he was Rick someone Moranis. that was influential and that was possessed by you know yeah you know the the powers, and so maybe Paul Rudd's kind of like that character, could and like be. that's he's true. gonna he's gonna be involved in that kind of stuff, which will give him interplay with that's the even Ghostbusters. funnier. I could see that being oh. even funnier. I mean, Rick Moranis, come on, come out of retirement, uh. my man. I need you in my life. You oh. right. So many classic movies for him. But this is exciting for me. Huge Ghostbusters fan. Huge fan of Paul Rudd. I think he's super funny. I think he's going to fit right in with the tone of the movies, the comedy of it. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm stoked. I still, to this day, hold Ghostbusters to be one of the funniest comedy movies of all time. I think there's so much timeless, classic, priceless humor in there that translates generations, and I love it. Now, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on Ghostbusters 2. While I loved it as a kid, objectively, when I watch it now as an adult, I realize that the movie was rushed. It was an obvious cash grab in an attempt to make a sequel because the first one did such good business. 
that there's some really kind of hokey, not thought out <laughs> plot parts, but I still do on a personal level enjoy it. But by far, hands down, the first one oh, is yeah, the first gold. One's fantastic. I mean, gold standard, but it's so good. And uh, for the record, I didn't see the the remake. Um, and it, it's not because it had anything to do with like the internet and all these people saying, I'm not going to go see it because I had women. I just, if I could go back in time and just erase Ghostbusters 2 and just have Ghostbusters and we never have anything else in the Ghostbusters world and it just stands there as a pristine yeah. monument to comedy, right. I'm okay with that. Sure. Um, and that was my only reason. It's like, I, I just, I'm kind of tired of the whole remake, 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 remake. Yeah thing yeah so this one's that's the only reason it's forgettable yeah there i mean uh what's her kristen kirsten kristen wig kristen she was good she was good in this movie it's worth seeing because yeah. she's funny and it's and it's she does a good job all right uh, the rest of it's in, kinda, netflix maybe yeah i don't know they just they didn't get the comedy right it doesn't yeah. have the same tone it feels it feels out of place to me but hey who am i just a, a guy just a that guy on a it didn't hit his funny bone. On, yeah. You know, I mean, what? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I hear you. Okay, so I've got one more thing here. Uh, so I'm a big Star Trek fan. I've really, really enjoyed Star Trek Discovery. We know there's going to be a spinoff um, that's going to be about, you know, uh, Section 31. That's going to be the Michelle Yeoh project. And we know that we've got an upcoming show about Jean-Luc Picard called Star Trek Picard. And Alex Kurtzman, who is show running Star Trek Discovery, is now, uh, along with CBS, officially announcing that Michael Chabon is going to be the showrunner for Picard. Chabon has also been involved with the writing and executive producing from the very beginning of Picard. And Alex Kurtzman basically said, you know, that Michael Chabon is, you know, like the best person to do this. You know, it's his dream job. Da, 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 da. He's going to be great at this. But basically, Alex Kurtzman, because he's doing so well with Star Trek Discovery, uh, CBS is pretty much going to be putting him in charge of all of the Star Trek projects. Um, kind of like the way Kevin Feige is on the MCU. Sure. Where like he's kind of the over the over lord looking down on all the projects Mm -hmm. and kind of you know directing the battle uh as a general would now you've got you know captains doing their own things with their squads and whatnot and that's the directors doing their own movies or showrunners with their own shows um but alex kurtzman's even kind of stepping back for season three of discovery uh he's bringing in uh, Michelle Paradise to be kind of the co-show runner. And I'm assuming that eventually he's going to pull out of being the showrunner for discovery and it'll just be Michelle Paradise. Uh, because, you know, like I said, he's got this other, you know, the spinoff on section 31. I like this idea. I like this idea that CBS is taking star Trek very seriously. Yeah. They know that they've got something good going right now for them and they're not trying to burn Alex Kurtzman out. Because my fear would be is if they were to burn him out, the quality of the writing, the quality of the show would immediately drop off. And then he wouldn't, if you spread someone too thin, they're not going to be able to do their projects. That's kind of my knock against J.J. Abrams. Is like J.J. Abrams starts Steps a away. show. He, he starts Alias. Alias is really good for the first couple se- seasons. Then he starts backing away from it. And steps away to start doing Lost at the same time. And Alias's quality kind of goes down. Then he does Lost. He does a few <laughs> seasons of Lost. And Lost is really so great. Good. And, then, and then he steps away to go do the Star yeah. Trek movies. And then Lost kind of falls off. And he does you know a Star Trek movie or two. And then kind of steps away. And it fa- yep. And then you know, Star Wars. And then yep. he you know, steps away. And now yep. he's coming back. Blah, blah, blah. Yep. It's like. He is great at getting the ball rolling, yeah. but like he never really like starts a project and sees it through start to finish, like a full TV series sure. or a, a movie franchise or whatever. Yeah. And that's his right. Like that's, you know, his, his choice. And maybe he just gets tired of something and wants new yeah, challenges. One of those creative minds. But I'm, I'm glad that CBS isn't looking at Alex Kurtzman saying like, this is the golden calf. This is the golden goose that's laying the golden eggs. We need to ride him right. like a like a pony all the way to the cross the finish line right. and just burn him out because I think everything then would suffer. So I like what they're doing here. Yeah. 
That uh, that makes perfect sense to me. Admittedly, I don't know much about Star Trek, and a large percentage of what you said went over my head. <laughs> that's, that's who these people are and what they do. Uh, I saw the J.J. Abrams movies. I'm a mainline Star Trek kind of guy. I like it when uh-huh. I see it, but I don't necessarily go out of my way to seek Star Trek. If talk to me sense. afterwards. I'm I'm gonna talk to me afterwards. I'm gonna get you to watch Star Trek Discovery because I think it would be something you Is would that really the enjoy. The one. Yep. Okay. The, yeah. The newest. The newest uh, show. It's got two seasons out. They're about 15 episodes each. They're about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour okay. long. And I think it would be right up your alley. Okay. I'm interested. So. I'm always looking for new shows. And the nice thing is about this show is that it starts in a place that's like kind of before the original series. And so like you don't have to know all of the lore and all of the things There's from all so the other much. series. Yeah. You can just go in yeah. fresh. Okay. So. Okay. Anyway, uh, that was the last thing I had in uh, Rebel Intelligence. Did you have anything else, Matt, or are you tapped out? I'm out. You are out. Okay. So, uh, Super Friends, last week, uh, Breed and I did a movie club, and we did a, a review of Toy Story 4, and we talked about what we thought about the so film. So good. And we didn't want to ask a question of the week that necessarily pertained to directly to Toy Story 4, because we know that a lot of you still may see the movie, maybe over this weekend with your family since it's the 4th of July. Um, so our question was, what toy from Toy Story are you most like personality wise? Like if you had like oh. a, a spirit <clears throat> toy, who would your spirit toy be? So Matt, I'm going to ask you that question. All the toys in Toy Story, what toy like do you identify the most? Would you say is like your spirit toy? Oh my goodness. You're putting me on the spot here. Uh, I would, I would probably, well, in my heart of hearts, I would say the latter versions of Buzz Lightyear. That's, that's, that's what I would say. Like when he realizes and he's self-aware. Yeah. Like completely like into it. Like he wants to do the right thing, but he's like not quite always in charge. He like listens to Woody and like, (laughs) I like, I think. I can identify with that feeling like you're part of something bigger than you are, you know? Yeah. I, I'm into that kind of a thing. Cause that's how I it's feel. Called, it's called marriage, right? Yeah. Well, you know, that, <laughs> that too, that too. Yep. But yeah, feeling like, you know, you're part of something, it's part of something big. Even if it got kind of taken from you, you still have that feeling of my purpose doesn't change just because somebody's changed the message of I'm going like deep here with toy story. Yeah, no, man. I, I like my, it though. I, my bad. I'm just trying to pull this all together here, but that's why I think just on an on an off the cuff, uh, I would say Buzz, but kind of the latter version, self aware version. Okay, I like that. That's a good answer. I uh, Breed and I talked about that, and I said Woody. I think is for me because you know I'm really big on family and and loyalty, and like Woody is loyal to Andy and to Bonnie to a fault. Yeah. He's loyal to protecting all the other toys. And like, if you're in my circle of people that I care about, like I try to go out of my way to do anything and everything I can to help those people and to be there for them. And and so that was my, that was my answer. Uh, Don't ask me what Brita's answer is for the life of me right now at this moment, I'm blanking it. Um, But we did ask the super friends and uh, we only, this is weird because I, I posted the, the, the media that said like, Hey, it's our question of the week, you know, blah, 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 respond. Usually I post the one that says like we record tomorrow and all the little things. And I accidentally posted just the plain image. So there was no like, oh, you know, Hey, no get this in by tomorrow thing. Yeah. Um, so we have two responses this week. Uh, the first one on email, which is Ford of nerd at gmail.com. Uh, it's Peter Christensen. He writes in, he says, dear nerds, I'm fine with end games record, gra- uh, record grabbing re-release. I'm curious about which movies sold more tickets. There's inflation since 2009, but Avatar drive adoption of 3D theaters and ticket sales. Um, I don't know. I know that Endgame probably isn't going to make it on this re-release. It's still a little short, although there's still time. It could trickle in more money. Also, Avatar like did like a re-release like 10 years later and did it like months later, whereas like this was released like 10 weeks after it initially yeah. hit. Yeah. So. They're just, I really think they're trying to hit on it. 
I think they're going to wait till awards season time. They're going to put it up for some awards season and then they're going to re-release it again for awards season to get people to go back when it's been like months and months and months. Right. I see that happening yeah. to get them across the finish line. Yep. But uh, he goes on to say, fun fact, the Tony Stark cabin uh, was also in Godzilla King of Monsters. We talked about how that Tony Stark cabin is actually an Airbnb that's now charging astronomical rates. <laughs> Apparently, people didn't want to go to the cabin from Godzilla King of Monsters, but, you know. Endgame. The Toy, the toy Story one in Endgame, yeah. The Toy Story one. The, <laughs> the <laughs> Toy Story one is a real place you can visit. The, it was filmed yeah, Right, there. exactly. Come to my house. Uh, <laughs> he says, as a college student, I lived in fear of going to girls' apartments and seeing the six... VHS collection of the BBC Pride and Prejudice. I've been compelled many times to watch it with friends, on dates, and latter with my wife. I reliably fall asleep once the sarcastic father has delivered most of his lines in the first half hour. Oh my gosh. Peter, I'm glad that you're honest enough, because like, I've never seen it, and I just kind of refuse. Maybe I'm a, a little more jerky than you. I'm just like, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, but I like that you admit that like you've tried but like you fall asleep and it just bores you to death and you'd rather sleep that time away than, you know, whatever. Uh, I like that. Um, he does go on to say he hasn't seen Toy Story 4, so he didn't hear the last part of the podcast, so he doesn't have an answer. Uh, but he says, cheers, Peter Christensen. Uh, I like that. I think that's good. Um, yeah, we talked about we talked about some favorite movies and stuff and... And our mother-in-law wrote in and said how, you know, she loves the BBC's Pride and Prejudice. And that's like her favorite movie of all time. It's also like her favorite like audio drama of all time oh, and her man. favorite book of all time and her favorite. And uh, Matt, I think I, I think we know now what to get her for yeah. Christmas. <laughs> Anything apparently that's Pride and Prejudice. She's into it. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah, good. But I, good I will know. never participate. Yeah, no, me neither. It just is not. In college, it was a thing. That's why I laughed at that comment, because that is relatable. Right? I mean, that happened. Girls had those things, and Matt, watch this. There is is a hard pass, sweetheart. I don't care how cute you are. I I'm out. Yep. This is not interesting. It was always, for me, it was the, hey, we're going to turn on Pride and Prejudice. <sighs> Do you want to kind of hang out and come over? That's always when I'm like, actually... I've got to go. I only had a couple minutes. I'd always have some excuse. And then I'd like walk like two apartments down the little hallway and I'd go see some other girls. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I will find girls that are not watching Pride and Prejudice and I'll hang out with them yeah, it's instead. Not my thing. Yeah, me neither. No. And, and if it is your thing, like no judgment, like you. that's your thing. That's awesome. I know, I, I know plenty it. of girls that would not want to like come over and like hang out with us while we watch 2003's Ang Lee's Hulk. <laughs> Which is not a great movie, oh. but at the time, it was like the best thing we had in the comic book world. <laughs> that was awful. It is an awful movie. So bad. But it was oh the only Hulk gosh. movie I we had. I saw opening night. I rem oh my gosh, it was awful. Anyway. Yeah. So bad. I get it. <laughs> I hate it. Uh, I, I get it. Uh, we didn't have anything on Facebook, but over on Twitter, we had a response. Uh, Ryan R. at RJR7336 says, I'm most similar to Rex. He gets nervous easily and doesn't <laughs> like confrontation. <laughs> and I and I like that because I cute. know a bunch of people in my life that I'd say if they were a toy from Toy Story, they would be Rex. Yeah. A lot of people like that. Yes. I'm not one of those people probably that you could think of in your life that's like Rex. No. But <laughs> no. no. Uh, not that I argue, but um, Rex, that's a good one. That's cute. I like that. Yeah, and I mean, come on. Nervous, don't want confrontation. I get it. Get, I, 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 yeah, lots of people like that. And who doesn't love Rex? No, Rex is Rex, the best. Rex is great. I love it. It's like that neurotic humor. <laughs> uh, Super friends, thank you so much for your uh, for your answers this week. Uh, the few they were, I, I'm going to take the responsibility for that, that I didn't uh, put the call to action out strongly enough and let you know when you need to get those answers in. Uh, but... What can the Super Friends do for us this week? Well, Matt, they can go like they always have the option of going over to iTunes and they can drop a review. Those reviews help us. There's a algorithm that iTunes uses that helps put us into charts and lists and eventually could put us on the front page of iTunes in the podcast section. 
and, you know, get millions of eyeballs and ears onto the uh, Fortress Nerditude podcast. So you can do that. Or you can do like our new super friend listener, Tony, did today. You can talk to someone, word of mouth recommendation, and subscribe to the podcast. And then you can hear us each and every week. It's as simple it's as that, Matt. Yeah. Or, you know, I always say, you can steal your friend's phone and you can subscribe for them. They won't know what's going on, but eventually they'll listen <laughs> and they'll go, hey, this is kind of cool. There is that option, and too. It's a good option. Yeah. It's solid. Solid, solid. Well, Matt, being that today, <clears throat> when this releases, uh, being that today is the 4th of July, the Day of Independence here in the United States of America, I thought it's only fitting that we talk a little bit about some of our 4th of July traditions, and then we also talk maybe about a movie that we love that's you know either about the 4th of July or Independence or that kind of hits on some of those themes. And uh, I thought that'd be kind of a fun thing to talk about today. I love Seems it. appropriate. Absolutely, super. So let me ask you, Matt. Do you do you have like things that you did growing up in Texas or with your family that like you would do every Fourth of July? Like, what were your family's Fourth of July traditions? I've been thinking about this because I don't know that there were a ton of traditions. I remember doing fireworks in our front yard because texas doesn't uh-huh. have laws so we can do whatever fireworks we well please I um like it. <laughs> as long as there's you know a little bit of moisture but right uh so i remember some some fun mishaps here and there with those fireworks shooting at the house and you know fun things like that uh that's really kind of the the main event of my fourth of july memories but as i got older my my grandpa on my mom's side bought a ranch in Montana and probably now for the past 15 years has put on a relatively professional fireworks show. Really? So our lives changed when that happened and we go, I mean, before I got married, I was up there every year since I was probably 15 years old, maybe 14. um, And we would enjoy a day full of, activities uh it's about 500 acres so it's a massive ranch big piece of property four-wheelers eventually this became an event that the community in helena montana was and still is invited to so we had to set up places for them to park and we would hire people to be parking attendants and we'd set up chairs and i was always in charge of the audio and the music portion and i've uh played guitar and sang for a long time. So I would always be the pre-show as people were coming in, I'd be playing my guitar and singing and it just became a big, a big party. So that's kind of where the tradition lies now is up at the ranch in Montana. We, we blow it up big. Obviously Mm. grandpa's got a little bit of cash. Well, Um, if he's inviting the town and hiring, (laughs) you know, yes. So it's parking attendants. It's a big deal. And, uh, it's, like, was this something like he would charge like admission to? No, he would never. Uh-uh. So just free to just the community. Just come on up, park your car. We got a big patch of grass, and it goes over this lake pond, pond that he put in. It's on the backside of this pond. You just sit back, and we've got music that you know plays while it's happening. And uh, there's always like a prayer and a 4th of July message about, you know, freedom and the things that we enjoy and uh you know there have been ballet people who have come up and performed from the community so it's been this this uh this big event and this is the first year he's actually hiring a true professional pyrotechnic squad i don't know what they are but you don't hear about that very often company right. uh and company, they're doing probably, like a yeah. legit like for real display hmm. um And the fire trucks are always there just in case. I mean, it's always, it's a lot of fun. So that's kind of been our tradition over the last 15 plus years is. Well, it's it's something that's kind of cool because that's like a family tradition that like your family, I mean, your grandfather like started this just not, you know, just not for the family's benefit, but like for the community's benefit. Oh yeah. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun and it gets bigger and bigger every year as more and more people hear about it. I mean, there was a 
F, I don't know, my grandpa's big into planes, so some F something or other flew over last year as the we were singing the national anthem. It was cool. I mean, they he really they really do it out big, so it's a lot of fun. Wow. It's a lot of fun. Wow. That's cool. My uh so it's, it's a little different than yours. Uh, you know, my my family didn't start some, you know, big huge firework <laughs> bonanza thing. Um but uh, when, when we moved to Illinois in, uh, the summer of 1988, um, we'd always up to that point, we'd always celebrated the 4th of July. So, uh, I originally was born in Utah. That's where my dad grew up in Orm, Utah. And, um, we used to go and see like a 4th of July parade. And then they would do, I remember we do like fireworks in front of my grandparents' house in Orm. And then we could, you know, see the fireworks that, you know, were kind of all down along the mountain range, uh, from grandma and grandpa's uh, house or from their, you know, um, I was going to say ceiling, but roof, roof is the <laughs> word, uh, ceiling on the inside would be weird. Yeah. Um, but when we moved to Illinois in the summer of 88, we didn't really know where to go. And I remember my parents said they asked some people in the local church we went to and they said, Oh, there's a park over in DeKalb that a bunch of us are going to. And a lot of us that don't have family in the area all get together and we, you know, kind of do a big kind of like barbecue, a big kind of, you know, like kind of pot lunch luncheon type of, you know, thing over there. And we all kind of, you know, get an area together. And so, we went over there that first summer and, you know, we did the traditional thing is kind of on this, this kind of this hill, this kind of gradual hill. And then down at the bottom of the hill, there's this big kind of, you know, bandstand area with this big clamshell background mm-hmm. and you kind of face down there and we laid out blankets and we, we did the kind of the normal, just kind of hot dogs and hamburgers. Yeah. But during the daytime, cause you, you really did have to like get there early to stake out your, your location. Uh, during the daytime, all of us kids would just kind of run around because right adjacent to that park was a big, huge playground area. There was also a pool. And then on the other side of like this fence uh, was a golf course. But like they had kind of a storm, dr- a big storm drain that kind of ran from the park side underneath the fence to the uh, golf course side. And it was big enough that adults could walk through it if need be. And so us kids, you know, we'd always go running down and go through there. And then like, we try to find golf balls and whatever. And so we just kind of run around and play. But the, during the kind of like the late afternoon in down in the clamshell on the stage, there would always be performers and it would be like the local karate troops would come and Hmm. put on demonstrations and break boards and break center blocks and clowns would come and make, you know, balloon animals and do, you know, the hokey little, you know, jokes and the honking of the nose and the (laughs) squirting water out of the lapels. And there would be like different, different like little groups from the community. They would come and like demonstrate skills or things they can do or whatever. Um, But then the highlight though, before the fireworks would start is about an hour before the fireworks start, right around eight o'clock, there would be a big orchestra that would come and fill in the band shell and they would start playing a bunch of like classical music, uh, you know, the Beethoven and the Brahms and the Bach and all that kind of stuff. And so they play all this classical music and then about five minutes before the, um, the fireworks would start, they would kind of take a little break. Then they would play the national anthem, which was always amazing. And then right after that, then they would break into like the John Philip Sousa. It's, you know, stars and stripes forever. It's, you know, yeah. all the, the big hits. And when they'd start playing that, that's when they'd start doing the fireworks. And I remember because this is like lived in our family history. We always talk about this. Someone would always get up and start giving some like rousing 4th of July speech while this music's going on. And he'd always end it or always end it the same way. He's like, you know, duty, honor country <laughs> but it but it had that very chicago like duty honor country yeah. kind of sound to his voice which i always got a kick out of but as they're doing that and he's kind of finishing up and the music is just getting real loud fireworks are just going off everywhere and it was a spectacular fireworks show i mean it doesn't hold up to like the big ones like you'd see like in new york or la or right. chicago or you know something like you know dallas or something like that But as far as like a local small town, it's probably one of the best I've ever seen a small town put on. Very cool, yeah. And now I'm to the point, Matt, where 
if we watch fireworks and we can see quite a lot from our backyard, to me, it's not the same. I want to be in, I want to be in a park and I want to see the fireworks, but more importantly, I want to hear all the patriotic music being played while the fireworks are going off. Yeah. Cause for me, that marriage of the patriotic music and the fireworks reminds me of my childhood. It reminds me of what the 4th of July was like with my dad. Cause yeah. 4th of July was my dad's favorite holiday. And you know, my dad's been, you know, my dad passed 17 years ago. And so I don't get to experience that with him anymore. So when I do get to have that moment where I'm somewhere and I hear the fireworks and they're playing the John Philip Sousa, the big rah-rah patriotic marches, to me, that's always like a special moment. That's awesome. And like that little memory of doing that Hopkins Park, because we did it from 1988 to, I mean, well, they did it until dad passed and mom moved away. But from, for me, it was 88 till about 98 when I when I left home. Those 10 years, every it was reliable. Like, that's what we did. Wow. And so, uh, so for me, that's like one of my favorite kind of Fourth of July memories. Cool. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's good times, man. Just Very good cool. times. Yeah, Fourth of July so, is great. One of my favorite holidays for sure. Well, I mean, you get to blow stuff up. You get to have good food. Love the food. You you get to go to parades, which I always kind of find to be fun and kind of boring all at the same time. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think that's what parade means when you look it up in the dictionary yeah, right fun, fun and yet boring, boring. yeah <laughs> although kids love it because of, you know the throwing of the candy and whatnot sure. although gosh my boys just get more reckless each year they run further and further i'm like you are gonna get trampled by the horses <laughs> or a, a you know by the dancing you know little girls twirling the batons yeah. like back up oh yeah <laughs> every year i swear I swear. Uh, so what about you for movies? Like if you have a movie that identifies the 4th of July or kind of patriotism, like what's that movie for you that like hits the spot? This was tough to think about because a lot of movies came to mind that I associate. This is what I did. There's movies I associate with the 4th of July and or summer. Yep. And then there's movies that I associate with patriotism. And I went with the patriotism route. Okay. I don't watch this movie on the 4th of July. I watch this movie whenever I darn well please because it's one of my favorite movies and it is Miracle. Oh, yes. The U.S. hockey team, 1980. Absolutely. Just, I love, love, love that movie. I love- I was one when the actual event happened. <sighs> so I don't have any real memories of that event. But, but- you were breathing. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> I and that movie, that movie's great because it does stir that patriotic feeling in you, no matter totally. if you were alive or not at the time. It totally does. It's this us against them and the freedom mentality and rush. I mean, it was just this, it makes you feel like you were part of it. Like you said, even though we weren't, either you don't remember it or weren't born or whatever, it makes you feel like you were part of this moment in history that was political without being political. And I mean, it was, it was, it's just... Everything about that movie just makes me happy. I love hockey. That's obviously part of the reason I'm so oh, big yeah. into miracles because there aren't a lot of hockey movies. I mean, you get the Mighty Ducks, which don't get me started on how amazing those movies are. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a hockey movie, I've seen it and I like it. But anyway, back yeah, to yeah. back to Miracle. It's just so good. And then back to what I said at the beginning. I said we're going to come back to one time. The speech in the locker room just makes yeah, me Brooks. feel things. Yep. Oh my gosh. Kurt Russell does such an incredible job in that movie. Everything about it. I mean, they cast real hockey players, not actors, right? Those are real hockey players. They're right. really playing hockey. And the camera work is really people on the ice during this stuff, getting hit over. I mean, this is, it just is so cool. It captures hockey beautifully. It captures like the psychology of the players so perfectly and the coach. And I mean, everything about it just speaks to me and the patriotism just puts it over the top is one of my favorite movies. And you know, one of the first things I think of when I think of a movie about the U S of a, Hmm. You know, something I just learned about you. I didn't know you were into hockey. Oh yeah. I did not. I did not know that. Like for me growing up in Chicago, uh, most of my childhood and, you know, into my early adult years, like going to Blackhawks games and watching hockey, like, it's big in the Midwest. Yeah. Like it's big back there. And uh, 
so, you know, if I'm back there, you know, I assume, you know, people either have passively watched enough hockey or they're active hockey fans. But you growing up in Texas, I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have pegged <laughs> you as a hockey guy. No, you wouldn't. And I got made fun of it in high school. And I'm also, as you know, I just don't really care what you think, what anybody, you know, sure. that's just my, yeah, yeah. I do me and you do you. And I'm cool with that. And hockey is one of those things, even to this day. I mean, my friends still think it's ridiculous that I'd rather watch the Stanley Cup playoffs than the NBA playoffs. Um, as much as I love the NBA and I do, it's a little boring. Stanley these Cup's days. more exciting. The Stanley yeah. Cup playoffs, man. I'm so I'm a big Sharks fan. Um, that's where I was born. It's where my family is from. Is in California, though. I grew up in Texas, so I I, I feel a pull toward those teams in the Bay Area, except for the Warriors. I don't feel any pull there. Yeah, but okay. yeah, there's hockey is. Uh, it's my favorite. Sport. I like that. I, I love that. I love that. That's good. I, I too love hockey. And obviously, I mean, I'm a huge Blackhawks fan. I've seen the Blackhawks win the Stanley Cup three times in my lifetime already. I've seen them get close yeah, a few yeah, other times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we did, I think, eliminate the San Boo, Jose uh, yeah. Sharks in order to in get like there. In like 2000, hmm. uh, I don't know, 11? 2000, 2000. Later than that? Was it 11? I thought it was maybe it was 2009, 2010. I'd have either to go back way, and look. yeah. Either way, there was like we it had like was, three Stanley. We hoisted Lord Stanley's Cup three times in like six years, so it was very. We nice haven't done it in loyal franchise fan. history, so. Yeah. Hey, d- d- hey, trust me. Then there's the <laughs> Cubs, and I, you know, finally <laughs> saw that That's happen. True. So you did see yeah, that, I, yeah. I, I know about long droughts in <laughs> franchise history. Yeah. Uh, well, it's cool. So you went the very patriotic way, yes. uh, which I think is cool. And, uh, I considered going that way, but I actually went the other way, the other way you talked about the more of the kind of the summertime feel, the, you know, that mm-hmm. one. So I went with the sandlot and the sandlot is obviously, it, it takes place over the 4th of July weekend during part of the, the film. But it, to me is that kind of quintessential movie about, childhood and summertime and like the innocence of that uh you know it's the story of a coming of age with this boy who moves uh moves to a new town and he wants to fit in with a a group of boys that are you know there in town and they play baseball and eventually he's able to join the team because like the best player on the team kind of takes pity on him (laughs) kind of brings him under his wing a little bit Uh you know this is benny benny who will be nicknamed the jet later on um but the the fun part about this is that it's a great movie that I think most people can relate to. I think it captures the essence of summer perfectly. But then there is that scene where the boys all decide to play a game of night baseball on the 4th of July. And you've got all the fireworks going on overhead. And that's what like illuminates their field. And they play. And it's just this beautiful moment for me because it's it's baseball. And nothing is more American than baseball when it comes to sport. I mean, it is the national pastime. It is what has unified people over generations uh, for such a long period of time. And so it's baseball, it's summer, it's the 4th of July, it's kids, it's, you know, it's little boys having crushes on, you know, the lifeguards at the pool, (laughs) and it's boys, you know, getting into their parents' chewing tobacco and giving that a try and, you know, puking all over the carnival because, you know, they did something they shouldn't have done and something stupid and boys getting into trouble because they get a baseball over in the neighbor's backyard and they've got to retrieve it and the Mm. whole, you know, kind of thing. But then there's also this underlying story about this boy also doesn't have a good relationship with his stepfather Mm -hmm. and through his association with the other boys, he manages to kind of mend fences and kind of, you know, get a, better relationship with a stepfather it's just a classic movie it's classic summertime it's classic kind of that fourth of july it that atmosphere reminds me of kind of my childhood not so much the baseball aspect but like my childhood as far as like that feeling i think it does a real good job of capturing that emotion i agree completely it's uh it's almost a perfect movie i mean i don't know i wouldn't change anything about it and that was, this was my, we spoke, this was also on yeah. my list. I mean, this was, it's always what I think of when I think of, I want to watch a movie on like the 3rd of July to get excited for the 4th. Right. I don't watch Christmas movies on Christmas. I watch Christmas movies before Christmas. So on right. it's the Sandlot is like the 3rd of July. Like that's what I want to do. I want to laugh 
at Squints and Wendy Peppercorn. I mean, just the whole yep. everything that happens in that movie. I completely agree with you. It's it's an it, incredible movie. It just captures it. You're right. Being a kid. It's it's interesting though. Like so, we we both I think had a few other movies that like, we thought about, and like you can do a Google search for like you know top ten, top twenty movies for the 4th of July and you get a lot of like the patriotic stuff. Like you get things like born on the 4th of July that'll come up and the Patriot that'll come up and like Forrest Gump. And I think things that invoke the patriotism feel of the, in the United States, uh, you get those. And then you also get things like jaws. And I, (laughs) I had a real tough time trying to find room for like, but I want to say jaws is one of my top kind of 4th of July movies. Cause I love that movie like tremendously. And it takes place over the 4th of July weekend. And that's the reason like why they don't shut down Amity, the, the little island. Yeah. Because it's the 4th of July and everyone's coming in and they want to get all the money, blah, 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 yep. from 4th of July and tourists. <clears throat> but at the heart of it, the movie doesn't have the like the really 4th of July feel to it. it. It just happens to be that it takes place over the 4th of July right. versus that 4th of July feel. It's really kind of a, a suspense, almost not horror, but a suspense movie mm-hmm. about a freaking giant shark that's eating human beings. It's such a cool um, premise. <laughs> it, oh, it's such a great a good premise. Movie. Get this. So I had to like wait. I had to wait. It's like Sandlot or Jaws. Sandlot or Jaws. And I think Sandlot's it the more, is more. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. But get this. Jesse has never seen Jaws. <gasps> really? I searched for it on like every streaming thing last week. And I can't find it, so I'm just gonna have to buy the freaking movie. I've got I've got that thing on I mean, DVD. Yeah, yeah. It's it, you have to see it. They have this cool thing. Speaking of Austin, the cool thing in Austin where they they project Jaws every Friday and Saturday night onto this big inflatable screen on a lake, and you sit in Ooh. inner tubes and you yes. watch Jaws. How cool is that? Uh, uh, I, so cool. I did that on a date in college. I did got a, like a robo and a generator and I had like my TV DVR combo. <laughs> so cool. Row out into the little lake and I had a, you know, cable that stretched all the way back to land. And we watched it in a boat at night. So good. That's such a cool so experience. You, oh. you need to get a babysitter and you need to take Jesse to get in the tubes and go watch that movie. Oh man. I don't know if your pregnant body would want to do that, but <laughs> okay. True. Next year. True. Next year. Next year. Next year. Yes. I mean, that, oh so gosh, cool. that's such, such a good, such movie. a good idea. It's such a good idea and such a good movie. Totally. So yeah, don't let her watch that until you can do that. Cause then she could have like a truly, cause, <laughs> right. Cause like it's, it's not going to be as suspenseful now because the movie's been out for you know, like a gazillion years. Right. But if you could do something like that where you're going to like ramp it up a little bit more, mm, that's a good idea. So good. Ugh. That is a good idea. Well, I want to ask the Super Friends, what is their favorite 4th of July movie? Now, you can go the patriotic route or you can go something that just, you know, kind of represents the 4th of July, summertime. I mean, if you come to me and you say, hey, Dirty Dancing, because it takes place in the Catskills over the 4th of July and during summer and da da da, <laughs> like, that's an yeah. acceptable answer. That's an acceptable answer. Um, so I want to hear from you, Super Friends. What is your favorite 4th of July slash summer film uh, or patriotic slash 4th of July film? And you can get us at all the normal place, uh, places, the email, which is fortofnerd at gmail.com. Twitter at Ford of Nerd, Facebook, which is facebook.com slash Ford of Nerd. We're on Instagram. Uh, we got the voicemail number. You can call 801 477 7687. And, uh, and we will read those answers next week. Matt, thanks once again for hanging out here in the Fortress Nerditude with me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. We'll have to do it again soon. Well, from all of us here at the Fortress Nerditude to all of you out there, wherever you may be, may the force be with you. Always.